If you search for the phrase worst programmer, you'll find lots of articles and posts on this topic. And the commonest answer to the question, who's the worst programmer that you've ever worked with by those authors is usually me. I was the worst programmer. And don't get me wrong, I've certainly made plenty of mistakes and stupid mistakes during my time, but I'm not the worst programmer that I've ever worked with. So let's take a look at some of the candidates and what it makes to make them quite so bad and maybe what we can learn from those things. Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Modern Software Engineering. Welcome to our channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. And if you came looking for continuous delivery, don't worry, you're in the right place. We've just rebranded the channel recently. Let's begin with a couple of examples that were certainly bad, but to my mind, don't mean that the programmers themselves were necessarily bad. Very early in my career, I was approached via a friend to write some code as a side gig. I was offered what seemed at the time like quite a lot of money to write a Windows application for Windows version two. That's how old this story is. This application would allow someone non-technical to design and build forms to collect data and store that data in a database somewhere. It wasn't rocket science, but I'd never seen anything like it up to that point. So I'd started working on it and experimented with coding and dynamic UI and the tools to build the forms. I was making decent progress. I'd spent a few weeks, maybe a couple of months of my spare time all told working on the project. This was being chased at this point by the client to see what progress I'd made so far, when my hard disk failed and I lost all the code, all of it. Inevitably, I didn't have a version control at that time and I hadn't backed up my code. So I lost not only all of my code, but also the contract that I'd been promised. My second story wasn't me, but I was there. This was 20 years later in my career and I was leading a project to build a point of sale system for a large UK retailer. This retailer's busiest trading period each year was during a public holiday in the summer. And the next such bank holiday was the Monday after this particular weekend where this story happened. The project was one of the early CD pioneer projects. We hadn't quite sorted out the best things to do at this stage, but we were making good progress and releasing fairly reliably. We had released a new version ahead of this big trading weekend, but something had gone wrong. It was Saturday morning and I was at home and I got a phone call saying that there were problems with the release. This was a big deal. We were releasing to thousands of stores and the biggest trading period was two days away. I got into the office to find a group of fairly stressed looking colleagues all working through the problem. They divided the work up and were looking at the problem from a variety of different angles to figure out what was going on. So I joined in. One of my colleagues was looking into how to recover the main database because part of the problem had resulted in us writing out some corrupted records to the production database. He was working on the live production database. So you can probably see where this is going. He dropped a couple of tables in the production database, losing all of the data and only then realized that he should have backed that data up or at least been working in a test environment to try out his ideas first. I've rarely seen anyone go quite so pale quite so quickly. He looked sick as he realized that he'd lost production data in the middle of an active trading day. And we had to work really hard to recover what we could from all the backups. Let me pause there. We're extremely fortunate on this channel to be sponsored by Equal Experts, Transfic and Tuple. Tuple builds software to make pair programming easier for people who work remotely. All of these companies though offer products and services that are extremely well aligned with the topics that we discuss here every week. So if you're looking for excellence in continuous delivery and software engineering in general, please do click on the links in the description to below to check them out and support our sponsors. There are clearly lots of lessons to learn from both of my examples. And we did, but I don't think that either made me or my former colleague bad programmers. These were dumb mistakes that we shouldn't have made. And while both of us were being a bit thoughtless and careless at the time and wouldn't make the same mistakes today, I hope, we are human and bad things happen. Mistakes are a normal part of human endeavor. 
and in particular, a normal part of learning to do better. However good or bad we are as developers, we will all make mistakes. If you'd like to learn more about avoiding some of the more common mistakes that we should all be aware of and so try to avoid, then do check out my new book, The Software Developer's Guidebook, a collection of how-to guides on a wide variety of topics from a team organization to TDD and everything in between. There's a link to that in the description below too. So if being a bad programmer is not just about making mistakes, what is it that makes a bad programmer bad? It seems to me that it's much more about how we cope with our mistakes and how we learn from them that really makes the difference. The experiences that I have described and others like them are what have taught me how to avoid the more common mistakes that we all make. With solutions like working in small steps, all change to production via version control to be sure that we don't lose anything along the way. And working in ways that make it easy to spot our mistakes and ensure that we always have an easy route back to safety when we find a mistake. Being able to spot our mistakes as soon as we can is important. These days, I'd say foundational and organizing our work so that we can rehearse every change to production with automated tests in controlled test environments ensures that we can limit the blast radius of any mistakes that we do make and discover them more quickly. It's this ability to learn from and avoid those same mistakes over and over again that really differentiates the good programmers from the bad to my mind. The habits of the best programmers are nearly all about this finding mistakes and making sure that we don't make the same mistakes again. This takes thoughtfulness and insight into how things work and relies on us doing a lot more than merely blindly following some arbitrary recipe for things or relying on some tool without thinking about the value that it offers and what it really means to us and why it's helpful or not. We need for this an internal model that allows us to understand what really works and why. And when it doesn't apply, because there are always trade-offs for every choice and all rules don't always apply. Good developers know this and weigh their options to decide what to do. Having said that though, some mistakes do seem to be more obvious and should be more easily avoided than others, leaving us more culpable if we fall into those traps. I asked some of my friends for their examples of bad mistakes and bad programmers, and I got a lot of funny stories. One of my favorites was from Martin Thompson, who told me of a system that he was asked to optimize many, many years ago. It was a Corba system, which tells you a little bit how, how long ago it was, which is a distributed object-oriented component-based technology. This system though, was designed with a single method called do it. The interface description language that described this interface handled over 230 parameters one of which was called command ID, which told the function what to do. And depending on the value of command ID, that changed the set of parameters that were applicable and their meaning. This design is so bad that it's kind of shocking that anyone could miss so much about design in general to even think of it. But even more fundamentally, it misses what programming is almost for entirely. This certainly has nothing to do with either object orientation or Corba though. This is just shockingly poor code. There are though excuses even for this level of poor design and design blindness and incompetence. Another of my friends once told me about a system that they worked on at a famous car company, which had almost the same mechanism, but in a different form. This system was a car configuration system. It encoded all of the different options that make up a car, color, engine size, trim level, wheel size, and so on. But the first version of this system was built many, many years ago for a mainframe computer, which used punch cards for the input and output. So the configuration of the car was represented by a single punched card, and so was limited to 80 characters worth of data. Over the years, cars and their configuration became more and more complex and the number of variations expanded. So subsequent generations of programmers working on this system kept adding more and more complexity to the configuration and the interpretation of this code on the card. By the end, 
supporting more combinations of coding than could be supported in only 80 characters. So over the years, a very complex, very inefficient mechanism evolved that changed what each value in the 80 character config code meant, depending on the, on the preceding values on the card. They implemented a kind of custom compression algorithm, but with a practical result that some configuration options were tied together, only because the code couldn't support every combination. So for example, you could only select some colors for a given engine size. This was clearly ludicrous, and my friend's team was tasked with replacing the system that managed the car configuration in Java. But by this time, almost every system in the company used these codes, and so it was practically impossible to change them. They ended up re-implementing this ridiculous complex configuration encoding in Java, retaining the crazy 80 character code to define the car's configuration even though the technical 80 character limit of punch cards was already decades in the past. These programmers weren't stupid, they weren't really bad programmers, but they were working under some bad constraints. So sometimes circumstances and history can limit our choices and can get in our way of doing a better job. Nevertheless, I confess that I think I'd have tried hard to find some kind of translation layer to try and duck this problem and at least isolate it so my new part of the system could do something better. Martin, though, was a rich source of crazy stories. Martin is a world expert on high-performance software systems. He helps companies to improve the performance of their systems. These are usually ultra-high-performance systems. Profiling the performance of code like this is essential to spotting problems. He tells me that he often ends up playing a game of trying to spot the business logic, the stuff that's meant to add value, amidst the performance sucking noise of all the accidental complexity that surrounds it in the performance traces that he makes. He says that most systems spend an order of magnitude more time on logging than they do on performing useful work. He told me of one team building a supposedly high performance system which he profiled and found logging to be an even bigger cost than usual. As he dug in and started looking at the code in more detail, he found that every single line of logic was surrounded by two log statements. When he asked the team why, they said, how else can we debug the code? Uh, ever thought of using a debugger? Apparently not. So we can all make mistakes, we can all find ourselves in situations that force us to do things that we'd rather not. We may even be ignorant of important ideas, techniques or technologies that limit our effectiveness. I figure I can forgive the first two more easily than the third, which seems more culpable to me. If you're a programmer who doesn't know how to use a debugger, then learn to use a debugger. If you're writing high performance code, Learn how to use a profiler too and see where the time is spent when you're running it. If your sense of design is so poor that you accept do it methods with 230 parameters as an acceptable solution, then either stop now and learn how to do better before you write more, any more code that the rest of us have to maintain or find a different job because you really aren't a programmer yet. But even this is still not the worst programmer in my book. The worst programmer I ever worked with knew he was bad, but then cheated every way that he could to hide it. I was working for a consultancy where we did a lot of what we thought of as rescue projects, coming in and fixing projects that were otherwise going wrong. My team had rescued one such project for a big client, an insurance company, and I'd been asked to help with another new, bigger project when we finished. We inherited several developers from the clients and a few consultants that our client had worked with in other projects in the past. One of these was my worst programmer. A few weeks in, I started to hear some grumblings from some of my teammates about the code from this programmer. He was always slow, but worse than that, nothing he wrote actually seemed to work. I was asked to take a look at his work by the client. I looked at some of his code and it was appallingly bad, at the most basic level. I remember looking at some of his code that he'd written to supposedly store some data in a relational database. He was accessing a single table and the table was called table and the columns were called one, two, three, and so on. 
In this code that accessed the table, he defined constants called one, two, three, and then assigned values of numerical values of one, two, and three. It was naive nonsense. One of the assignments in this list of constants was even wrong. I don't recall the details of, of the for loop was doing now, but he tried to write a for loop, but he clearly didn't know the syntax for that in Java. So he manually unrolled the loop and hard coded every iteration of the loop, which made no sense at all in this function. You couldn't pass arguments in and change the behavior of the function. The function always did the same thing. So the code worked for one set of input data. I reported back to the client and said, I don't think that he should work on this project. He wasn't good enough. And they went pale. What do you mean he isn't good enough? He's been doing all the code reviews on some of our most important projects. Apparently this consultant was getting premium rates for his code review skills. So we took a look at some of his code reviews as well. And it turned out that as we suspected, he didn't know Java at all and not really any other C family language as far as we could tell. His code reviews for these other critical projects were the result of him loading the code into a code analysis tool called Rational Rows and then using its code review feature to spit out a nicely formatted document. Incidentally, it was the client that had bought the licenses for Rational Rows. So the advice was not only pretty basic, but they were also paying for it at least twice. The guy did everything he could to hide his lack of programming and was earning good consultancy rates when in reality, he was barely able to write Hello World. It's certainly true that there's more going on here than this person's poor skills. But to my mind, this was the software equivalent of someone who isn't a surgeon conducting surgery or someone who isn't a pilot flying a plane. Sure, this was insurance, not surgery. So no one's life was directly at risk, but at best he was defrauding the company that was in employing him. And it might have had more serious consequences than that, who knew? costing them not only his fees, but also some of my fees and the fees of our teammates, because we had to either discard what he'd written or write it all together or rewrite it from scratch or refactor it to make something that worked, which given how terrible his code was, was sometimes longer to do than rewriting it from scratch. So yes, we can all make mistakes, but surely we have a duty of care to do the best job we can. And that includes being able to recover and learn from our mistakes and not try to hide them or hide from them. Thank you very much for watching. And if you enjoy the content here on the Modern Software Engineering channel, please do consider supporting us by joining our Patreon community. There's links to that in the descriptions below. And as usual, I'd like to offer my great thanks to the patrons that support our channel. Thank you very much. It's through your help that we're able to continue delivering this content. Thank you and bye-bye.